Welcome to the Roland JX3P from 1983 and the retroactive PG2K programmer for it, which just came out this year. Uh, so what do we do we have here? We have an incredible sort of hybridization of what I love about vintage synths in 2022, which is we can take a synthesizer that has an incredible architecture um, but didn't have a great interface at the time because a lot of synth manufacturers had to cut down the interface. And with modern technology and a company like Retroactive, um, we can now take that and basically jailbreak it and make it so that it feels um, as powerful as a modern synth or one of those more classic synthesizers from the 80s, like a Jupiter 8 that costs way more m money than any of us could ever afford. Um, so this is a really cool combo of brand new technology and uh, just inc incredible, gorgeous sort of golden era analog synthesis. And so the patch that I'm playing here, I actually made using both the patch generator from the PG2K um, as well as then going through and tweaking the knobs and stuff, which was incredibly easy. Um, so we're going to cover a lot today. It's not entirely a review of the JX3P or the PG2K uh, because both are pretty deep, but we're going to try to cover as much of both as possible, and it's going to be a lot of fun. So what did you guys think about that sound first off? I love this sort of... kind of halfway between an electric piano sound and a Juno 106 string sound. And that's a really, the biggest thing I want to convey with the JX3P today is that this is an incredible um, value compared to something like a Juno 106. So everybody loves the Juno 106 because it's simple and it's effective and it's classic. But the JX3P actually has a few tricks up its sleeve that make it potentially better. And what's funny about it, though, is it's sort of the ugly stepsister of the family, the Roland analog family. And so it doesn't really get as much love and they're undervalued, in my opinion. So you can usually get a JX3P for half or less, sometimes a third the cost of a Juno 106 because everybody wants a 106. But what's interesting about it is that it actually has the filter from the Jupiter 8 which the Juno 106 does not. So it's got the filter section of the most expensive Roland synth ever made. <laughs> um, but it's in this wonderful little package. And it's uh, just, it's amazing to me that on the vintage synth market, that these things don't cost twice as much as they do. But it comes down to the fact that, you know, people really love, uh, you know, the 106s. And uh, for good reasons, a great synth. But this has more power in a lot of ways. So let's go ahead and pull up some patches here. And that way we can hear what this synth sounds like. And you guys can go ahead and give me some thumbs up or thumbs down on some of the sounds. So we'll start with string one. And uh, you'll notice that I do have just a very small amount of delay and reverb from uh, Valhalla delay, water echoes. Um, but when I hear that sound right there, I would totally believe that's a Juno 106. And it's because it's got an analog chorus. It's got DCOs, just like the 106, except it's got two instead of one. So for those of you guys who um, that don't know, the Juno 106 actually only has one oscillator and it's got a sub oscillator, uh, which allows you to basically get an octave down of that oscillator for free or relatively free. It's a lot cheaper than adding another oscillator uh, per voice. And so the Juno 106 kind of, that was one of the ways they were able to cut corners and bring the cost down on the 106. But the JX3P actually has two DCOs per voice. You can get those types of sounds by uh, Juno 106 sound simply by using the second 
um, oscillator as a square wave and bring it down in uh, down a few octaves, um, but uh, an octave or two, I should say. But you can also use it as a noise source, as a sawtooth as well. And um, yes, mom, uh, vulture mom, it's true that the filter. The filter is much more important um, than the oscillators, in my opinion. And for a lot of people who know their shit will tell you that because a sawtooth is more or less going to sound like a sawtooth. It's not to say that certain synths don't have a certain character. For instance, the Insonic SQ80, because it has low resolution oscillators, digital oscillators, it has a certain sound that's a little different than an analog. Um, vco or dco but it's not that big of a difference but the character of the filter is uh definitely the thing that will largely determine how the synth sounds so that's a good thing how much of the sound is from the synth itself and how much is the pg2k bringing to the table um the pg2k what it does is it's a programmer for the jx3p so the fatal flaw of the jx3p is that um, we have this map over here. I don't know if you guys can see it. It's just kind of off camera that has the numbers for all the parameters. So I can edit this synth um, if I go to, let's see, what is it? If I'm looking for the filter and I want to get the cutoff frequency, that is, I think, uh, the group A edit here. So I press this button, I believe. Whoa. No, wait, wait, wait. I think... You can absolutely program this from over here. Let's see, maybe I have to press this. Oh, and then I have to hit 15, right? That's the idea, okay. You can see that this little thing moves here. Um, oh, that's source mix. So if I put that in the middle, we're hearing both. But if I want to control the cutoff frequency, that's group B1. Here we go. That's what I was supposed to do. So you can control and program this synth directly from the JX3P. But you have to, you, you saw how kind of a bitch that was to actually go through and program that there. Um, you know, it took a second. I had to go find it. It's like confusing because there's two sets of group A and group B, and then you have to press the button and then you move this. I like that the L little LED moves. That's cute. Um, you know, it, it's uh, it's frustrating and it's it's a it's a time consuming process. And what the PG 2K allows you to do is it gives you every parameter right in front of you so you can control this directly and you can control a lot of parameters at once so i was controlling the high pass filter the cutoff of the low uh pass filter and the resonance of the low pass filter so i can crank that up and, you know you can do a lot more a lot faster as far as the sound though goes ryan you're only the only thing that's possible is the jx3p so this isn't contributing anything to the sound it's contributing to the capacity to access the parameters that you create the sounds with and as well as um really unlocking a lot of the features that people don't even know about with this and there's there's so much we're going to get into this too um Shane, welcome to the stream. Um, so it's really cool that you can kind of... You can even kind of create like band passy type effects by moving both of those knobs at once. Um, JX or JX8 or JX3P, which is better? All right, so that's a subjective thing, of course, because... Um, you know, you're going to have to come up with that. For those of you guys who don't know, um, well, let's play another sound here real quick. I don't want to stop playing sounds and get too chatty. Oh, I got two. I, oh, this is all fucked up. Let's go to preset. Uh, preset two. Let's go ahead and see.
So that's a good example of another analog string sound. Um, how's it going, Mighty Pinto? Good to see you, my brother. Um, so Shane, the there's the JX3P from 1983, and then I believe the JX8P came out in 85. They are extremely similar in a lot of ways. They're both six voice, even though the 3P says three and the 8P says eight, they are both six voice. Uh, analog dual DCO synthesizers. On paper, the JX8P has a lot going for it because it has velocity and an aftertouch, as well as a few other features that make it um, a little bit better for competing uh, at the time with things like the um, Yamaha DX7. However, most vintage snobs will tell you the JX3P is where it's at. And the reason, there's a couple of them. One is that the JX3P actually has the same filter as the Jupiter 8. Um, whereas the JX 8P has a, what is it? A 817A, uh, I'm sorry, the JX 8P uses the IR3R05 filter chip, which came out in the later analog sense from Roland, which is the same filter chip that was used in the Alpha Juno and the JX 10, which um, I think sounds great. I love my Alpha Juno, but the vintage synth, synth snobs will tell you that because it doesn't go fully uh, resonant, it doesn't self oscillate, that it is not as good. Um, and so I think it's different strokes for different folks. The fact that you can buy a true uh, Roland analog synth with a Jupiter 8 filter in it, is pretty crazy. So it kind of comes down to the fact that the sound of the JX3P is argued to sound better. Now, uh, Espen Craft has a great video where he compares the two of them. And effectively, I mean, I can't tell the difference between them. If anything, the JX3P sounds a little darker sometimes. So the filter is shaving off a little bit more high end, which maybe gives you a little bit more warmth to the sound. Kick the chorus on. So it's subjective, but you can listen to some of this and hear that this synth really does have a lot of analog warmth. Just this really captivating, beautiful tone to it uh, that is hard to capture with anything but an early Roland analog synth. Um, so yeah, uh, can't give you a definitive which you should get. Uh, one thing that I think is going for the JX8P is that a lot of the synth sounds were programmed by the legendary Eric Persing. And I think the soundtrack preset from that synthesizer is the most gorgeous pad sound ever created. It's not impossible to create it, something similar with the JX3P, but the true version of that pad uh, is the JX8P version. So that's something that's really cool about it. It was used by Angelo Badalamenti to do the Twin Peaks theme, and um, that's worth something. <laughs> he also used it to do the Mulholland Drive theme, I'm 99% sure. Um, hard to say exactly. So what are some of the things that make this synth cool are, so we're moving on to electric piano one. This is an example of a really cool electric piano tone that's all analog, but if you were to compare it to something like a DX7, you would hear it kind of fall flat. That's where the DX7 started to really kill analog sense was in the electric piano sounds. Um, 
So yeah, this is Roland's first MIDI synthesizer. So that makes it really special. Um, unlike later synthesizers like the Jupiter 6 and the 106, the Juno 106, and I think they all came out on about the same year, but this one only has MIDI um, like note on, note off messages. So that means you can't control everything uh, separately. And that's where the PG2K comes in. cool beautiful but not necessarily um competing with the dx7 in its own way the jxap did they tried to really push that analog synth to sound more piano like and more digital or electric piano like as well as adding um different cross mod stuff there's cross mod in this synth too but i believe the implementation is such that you could get more convincing bell tones as well because that's another area that made the DX7 stand out compared to traditional analog synths. Um, nice uh, hollow square wave sound. The clavichord. Let's move to the harpsichord. These patches are always funny to me. I don't know why anybody would use it. One of my favorite patches, stock patches from the JX 3P, is this vibraphone here. So let's check this out. Just a beautiful sound using the LFO uh, to control the volume of the patch. So you can hear, let's see if you can hear. Very slow, subtle vibration. Really cool. And it's got key tracking on the um, voltage control filter. It's possible to do that. So that's probably a little bit in there too. Sounds like an N64 dream sequence. Yes. And that's the um, one of the things that I find nostalgic about this synth is because it does have basically that saw square um, sound. It's not capable of doing stuff that isn't that. It's all, it does have sort of like dreamy Game Boy vibes in a way. Just very uh, gorgeous. So we've got Chime. So this is an example of how you can actually use the cross mod, which basically one oscillator controls the uh, way the other one re-triggers and you get these crazy clangorous metallic sounds. Sort of unpredictable in pitch. Uh, Quasimodo type sounds, so. Uh, let's move on to the Celesta. Definitely Game Boy-esque sounds. Speaking of gaming, I'm listening while making tacos, so forgive me while I lurk. Nothing wrong with a good lurk and jerk can be very um, thin too because of the high pass filter in a beautiful way very bloopy yes I agree accordion sound not a very convincing accordion here's an interesting one voice you guys tell me <laughs> I don't know about that, you know, and that's a good example of Roland, um, this synth coming out right around the same time as the DX7. Roland was in for a rough, rough couple of years where they uh, were making sounds like this while 
things like the Insonic Mirage came out where you could have actual samples of voices. And the DX7 had these really convincing sounds because they had more power digitally to do things. Um, so the patches like this really highlight um, what Roland was trying to do at the time. They should have just stuck in hindsight to those beautiful organic analog sounds because when they tried to go stretch it further than they should, you end up with shit like... Uh, group B here, violin. We'll try to get through some of these quickly. And again, um, you know, violin, suggestive of a violin, but not very convincing as far as like comparing that to a sample, right? Not to me anyways. Flute, love a flute sound. Actually pretty good. One thing that's uh, missing on the synthesizer compared to something like the JX-8P is it has no unison mode that I'm aware of. So uh, it actually, um, you know, there's no way to stack the oscillators on top of each other. The JX-8P, you can do that. So that's another advantage of the 8P. Um, so even though this is probably better for leads, there's no way to, you can still play chords over that. For better or worse. <laughs> um, whose voice? Fran Drescher's narrating a, a speak and spell. Yes, that's exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's rough. It's not, this is not what it could be. Um, so what are some other things to talk about? One thing is, I, this is like where, it, you know, the fact that the internet wasn't around, it's hard to know some things as facts. But what I understand to be correct is that Roland developed a guitar synth called the GR700. And it's actually the same architecture as the JX3P. So around the same time that the 106 was coming out there, said, hey, you know what? We've already basically made another synth that does something very similar to a 106. Why don't we take that idea and put it in a box more for players, like people who don't want to program stuff. We'll give it a bunch of sounds, but it will be, um, you know, like it'll have all of the features of the basically like something like a 106. It'll actually kind of sound better, but, you know, we won't put the uh, all the knobs and stuff. So for uh, those uninitiated in the world of vintage synthesizers, somewhere around 1983, Synthesizer companies realized that the knobs and faders, which were expensive to get right, and these faders are not the best. They're definitely a little uh, wonky donkey. Um, they realized that to, to save money, they could just do these like buttons. And, and honestly, this thing feels really well put together other than the faders. The buttons, everything feel great. It's wonderful metal enclosure. It feels like a tank. It's, I think, got one of the most beautiful paint jobs on any of the uh, vintage Rollins. Um, but kind of the fatal flaw is they needed to have all of this stuff on it because then it would have been a killer. Um, and, uh, you know, it, we didn't get that with this. So, uh, here's the oboe sound. So again, we're, we're kind of hearing that, you know, it's, it's interpretive. It's not anywhere near the samples that were about to become available uh, in the next couple of years in like 1985 or so. I like this one, this whistle sound. Pretty convincing. Moving on to a couple of my favorite patches and you'll know why synth brass one really uh massive really you know, triumphant, and you've got just like a little bit of either pitch or um, 
filter opening up on that. Uh, that's another thing that JX3P can do that the 106 can't is you can have the pitch control uh, one of the two oscillators. You can hear like a little bit in there where it rises very shortly, and that's part of how you sell an analog brass sound. Um, I guess that's how brass sounds actually sound. Uh, synth brass two. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here's the here's the ass that Daddy needs. just really thick and warm and lush. Um, you can get really massive with this. Just huge, really gorgeous. Um, different than an Oberheim though, right? You know, we've had uh, definitely some Oberheims on this channel and you know, that has a beautiful sound. I said some Oberheims, we've had the Matrix 6. I don't know a lot of Oberheims, but um, we've done a lot of Oberheimy type sounds like with the Kawaii K3 and other synths. And you know, this one to me, the way the filter is, you're just not going to get that particular sound. Uh, moving on to distorted guitar here. Square waves, not as good as other patches, juicy funk. Uh, so let's see here what we got a little bit of a uh, little of this action Pretty good also would be convinced that that's a uh, 106, you know sort of sound Kind of a classic roll-in sound and uh, here's a good example too by the way we can use this controller here this knob controls the octave of the first dco and this controls the octave of the second dco that stands for digitally controlled oscillator so they're an they're analog but they're controlled digitally the tuning is controlled digitally so we can immediately change the sound of what we're what we got going on here Maybe something like this. You know, so immediately you don't have to like do anything. You don't have to, on some sense, you have to like put them into a mode. Immediately this just works with that. I wanted to give that a second. Filter flow. We've got a couple of more experimental patches coming up. So uh, check this out. gorgeous one of the best patches filter flow is just so fucking good uh and highlights the power of these roland analog uh uh filters and what's interesting is here i want you to hear how smooth it is so if i play this very smooth um if i were to control this with the uh with the program you'll notice it's a lot less smooth Down there, you can hear it. What's called stepping. So stepping is a result of the digital implementation of the filter. So the filter's analog. 
and it will respond to analog smoothly. But when you're programming it, um, there's only so many values that it can be set to. So what happens when it's when you like save the memory? What it is is that the little microprocessor in there uh, looks at the position of every knob, um, basically a potentiometer inside of the synthesizer, and goes, "Okay, that's." closer to 7.5 than it is to 7.0. So we're going to call it 7.5. And um, so these earlier since this is, of course, the first one that's MIDI, um, they did not have a lot of resolution, many steps that the uh, any potentiometer could be. So it's not that the filter itself won't sound beautiful because, of course, it can. It's just that as you program it, you're going to get different results. So if I go back and I reload that patch here, you can... Let's crank the resonance. Resonance again being where it boosts around whatever frequency you're shaving off. So you get those real sharp... So you can hear it is pretty, pretty beautiful. Really gorgeous, throaty, resonant, sharp. That's really the character of like a Roland synth is that sharp filter sound. Shane, I have a Prolog 16 and one of these popped up with a control has been serviced for 12 Hundred Canadian. Yeah, that sounds about right. If it's got a controller, depends on what controller it is. I love this PG2K. I think it's amazing. If I were to recommend to anybody what's the ideal setup, it would be the PG2K with the stock JX3P. Espen Craft, the god of vintage synthesizers, is very against the Kiwi Technics um, upgrades to the JX3P. So what that is, you can mod out a JX3P to have more functionality but in his opinion, it changes the envelopes and, and loses the essence of the JX3P. So I would recommend something like uh, the JX3P and the PG2K, but 1200 is good in the neighborhood. Uh, by the way, guys, uh, if you haven't yet, please like and subscribe to the channel. It makes a huge difference. Um, we're trying to grow. We just hit 3,500 subscribers. And I have to say, something that I haven't said exactly, which is that you guys outperform every other YouTube channel at this size. Like I have the most incredible community, the generosity that you guys have on like the charity streams and just every stream, you guys are incredible. And the way that everybody shows up every week and we've got this wonderful community, the scum family. Um, when I hear like other channels talk about what to expect, like at their level, we're, our community is like a 10 K subscriber community or even more. And we have that at 3.5 K, but liking and subscribing does help. So if you guys haven't done that yet, if you're watching this video from the future, then that would be a great thing to do would be to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. It helps us grow. Uh, so, uh, let's give this a little, little something. Hmm. Would it be redundant with the prologue? Hmm. Fat fifth. Cinqua. Using the hard sync, sync sweep. Let's check this one out. Wow, that's really a cool effect, isn't it? It's like going up to a seventh, really unique. Um, Kira, welcome to the stream. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. Welcome, welcome. Uh, Shane, would it be redundant with the prologue? Okay, so there's certain ways in which it would. Um, I can't think of a single thing that this synth can do that the prologue can't in terms of just if you look at the specs, right? So it's got two digitally controlled oscillators. The prologue has um, 
three per voice, two voltage controlled oscillators and a digital oscillator, uh, which is different than a digitally controlled oscillator. Long story short, the filter is going to be a 12 decibel filter on the per octave filter on the Prolog, whereas on the JX3P, this is a 24 decibel per octave Jupiter 8 filter. So that's really the selling point is that if you want that vintage Roland uh, analog filter sound, which is different in the Korg Prolog, not better or worse, but different. Um, this will give you different results than the Prolog. Now, if I had the beautiful Prolog that I had in the synth room, I would actually find it fun to see if I could match, like say, um, the filter flow patch uh, with something. See how hard it would be to match that on something like the Korg Prolog. Um, but the pro prolog can do cross mod. It can do ring mod. It's got more LFOs, more envelopes, more of everything. I mean, there's, there's no thing that the prolog, uh, can't do that. The JX three P can do in terms of function, right? So really it's just going to come down to the sound and the prolog can sound, uh, really warm. It is an analog synth, but it can sound very analog in the sense that the oscillators will drift tune more than these oscillators will. These will stay very um, locked into tune. I mean, the Fat Fits uh, really emphasizes that, right? You get that. So all the detuning or the chorusing that's happening is from the analog chorus or the the fil the oscillators being detuned. But they're going to if I turn the chorus off real quick, let's turn the volume up a bit, and we'll control the fine tune, here, fine tune here. If I lock these into like a very fine tune. You can hear that they can get really tight, really, um, you know, and the the Prologs oscillators will too, but they'll, they'll they will drift a little bit though. Um, and what's more important is that voltage controlled oscillators, as they drift, will drift in a somewhat like more wandering, random, chorusing type way. Whereas as I apply a little fine detuning to this sound, you'll hear that. Um, the way the oscillators beat will be very predictable. So you'll hear a, a, a noticeable sort of sine wave. So for better or worse, you're going to have um, that sort of sound in the sense that you, you will hear less randomness in the sound than you will from a prologue. And in general speaking, people prefer a little bit more randomness than this. So I don't know if I answered your question, Shane, um, but that would be how I would describe this. Um, the, uh, the, the amplifier is analog in both of the synths. And I believe, uh, the envelopes are both digitally controlled in both of these synths. So this synth has digitally controlled envelopes and an LFO versus the 106 would had, uh, which had an analog amps or I'm sorry, envelopes and LFOs. So that's a difference that sort of gives the 106 a little bit of an advantage, but sort of my, if I was to tip my poker cards at you guys, I'm trying to convince you that the JX three P is a much better, uh, synth once you open it up with a programmer, I think it's going to sound better and do cooler things than a 106 and for a much better price point. Even the cost at, um, like the cost difference of buying a $500 programmer, which is expensive. You can get other ones cheaper, but I will, I think it's worth putting in this money. But you know, if you can get a programmer and the JX3P for 1200 bucks, right? Junos go for Juno 106s go for 2500 all day every day and the Juno 60 go for 4000 5000 so the fact that you actually get in my opinion a superior filter or at least a more legendary filter right it's the filter from a $25,000 synth in a $1000 synth is just like incredible value so anyways let's keep moving uh funky clav i think we're running out of these presets 
not that interesting. What a cool sound. Yo, it's Chad Romex King up in this motherfucker. How's it going, brother? Um, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Shane. And that sounds cool. So yeah, this Pulsar patch, also just one of the coolest patches. Um, it's using the LFO on one of the settings that gives it this cool sound. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's sample and hold or if it's something else. We'll get there uh, for sure. Um, glad to hear life is great, brother. By the way, how's everybody else doing? I hate um, just being a talking box about synth and not getting to hear about you guys. So please let me know how y'all do and what's new in your lives. All right, so we're moving on to planet here. You'll hear how the voices will uh, continue the sounds that you had before, but not... They, they will change them, so. Also another very evocative, beautiful patch. And uh, f finishing off the um, presets we have, a jet engine. Gotta have a jet engine patch. Tom, welcome to the stream. Yes, planet is really beautiful. Um, it's a couple of these, Pulsar, planet, and filter flow, I think are some of the best ones. I'm, I'm obsessed with filter flow. So good. And of course, with the PG2K, what we could do very quickly is right now it cuts off, right? Moment my fingers come off the keys, it's gone. Uh, whereas all I have to do is add some release here and well, I'm doing something wrong. Maybe it's envelope two. I don't know. <laughs> Let's uh, go back to main here real quick and change this. Hmm. Oh, maybe this isn't being controlled by that. Well, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but I'm doing something wrong for sure. <laughs> uh, it's quite chilly up here in the North Carolina mountains. Need some heat. Might put on the propane stovetop for some warmth. It's another advantage of having vintage analog sensors. They do heat up quite a bit. <laughs> uh, so that's definitely a thing. Um, let's see. What else is there to talk about? Well, we've covered just the basic presets of the synthesizer. Um, let's talk a bit about what we can, where we can really get crazy, right? So does the synth sound great on its own? Yes. But what about if we want to make our own sounds? So a lot of the vintage analog streams that I've done, I've gone through, played the presets and sort of reacted to how they sound. I'm going to drink some alcohol. Uh, but today I actually want to show you guys some sound design stuff. And Rob from Retroactive was actually nice enough to send me, email me the newest firmware yesterday while I was at Kennedy, Kennedy Space Center uh, so I could update this so that this video would be the most current version. Um, like any new product that's made by like one guy, like Rob is a one man company and uh, has been super nice to me uh, when he messages me 
uh, super cool guy, but you know, there's, there's little issues that show up and he's been very quick to address them. You know, if I ever send him anything, I say, Hey, I was having problems with this, which I did actually, this is part of why I've taken a bit to come to this is when this first came out, there were some issues with, uh, stock JX three P's. So many people who bought this have modified JX three P's Kiwi modified, uh, JX three P's that that's almost more the standard at this point. And um, so this works really great with that. And now it works really great with the stock ones, but on release date, it had some issues. And um, so Rob immediately addressed that and took care of that. So that's really awesome that a uh, little old me, he's responding to and uh, fixing problems that we've had. And that before I did this stream, he was like, hey, make sure that, you know, I'm going to send you this, make sure you update it um, so that we're the best version possible. And to, as far as I can tell, it's working 100%. So it'll be a lot of fun. Um, so let's make some mo fucking, let's make some fucking patches. So all I have to do is hit shift and this button, and we should have an initialize sound. And what we're listening to is, uh, just a sawtooth. It might be, um, the sawtooth, and the uh, both sawtooths. So we have everything here. And uh, let's see, I know the sawtooth oscillator mix is, uh, mix is here. So here's one sawtooth. So you can hear that if both of the oscillators are set to the same tuning, you get a very, very slow phase. So what that is, is that as the two oscillators beat next to each other, they're so close in tuning that they're actually canceling out a frequency. It's creating a notch that moves through the frequency spectrum and cancels that out. So anyways, if I move the oscillator mix back down, you can hear it's just the sawtooth. We can change the wave to, and it's helpful. It's got this little thing here. I don't know how well you guys can see that. Uh, it looks like you can see that it's got a little diagram of the wave. We can move it to uh, pulse, very narrow pulse, or a square. Game Boy sounds. So we've got those options. We've got pulse, we've got sawtooth, narrow pulse, and square. Those are our only building blocks. On oscillator two, we actually have a couple of different things. We've got. We also have noise, which could be useful for creating woodwind type sounds or anything that needs noise, all sorts of sci-fi stuff. Um, so anyways, we'll go back to just two sawtooths. Oh, I hit the fine tuning knob here. So here's at zero sense. So, sorry, I hit the course knob. So we can tune, first off, we could tune uh, oscillator two up a fifth, let's say. So we could do fifth type sounds, you know. which is very cool. You know, you could do, get sort of a uh, Roland D50 soundtrack type of sound to it. Um, one finger power chords, or uh, we could, you know, change that to a third. Get minor chords here, so we could go more Akira Yameoka. Definitely uh, some sort of techno sounds or like this sort of type of uh, neighborhood. But for now, we'll just leave the course tuning right at zero. Seems like I can get one or negative one, but not exactly. And so back to just that nice slow phase. As I adjust the fine tuning, that's how we get the more fat type sounds. So. 
You can hear how the phasing speeds up, right? And so we almost get sort of like Hoovery type stuff, you know, like. And we control the range if we want to go real dark with it. We could go down to 16 feet. Get a really great Reese bass sound. Really thick and dirty. So even though this synth is um, mono in, in far as it's, it's not stereo until you kick the chorus on, I mean, you can get really kind of sick trancy super saws just by using the detune. I mean, that's thick, right? And uh, we can move this over to square waves if we wanted to get a, you know, the difference here. So... I think it sounds really good with the square waves. Really cool. Of course, we could set the range to um, from 16 feet on oscillator one and eight feet on oscillator two, which means just an octave up. Really gorgeous uh, sorts of sounds. I don't know. I want to take a second here and ask you guys, how does this thing sound to you? You know, I get so wrapped up in like little minutia details, um, but I always want to know how these synths sound. And it's like one of those funny things, like the Kwai K1 is a good example, a synthesizer that is considered by the Vinci synth knobs to be the worst. And everybody on the channel seemed to like it. So, so far, what are your guys' impressions of this synthesizer? I want to know um, because it's all well and good if I think a synth is fine, but I want to know what you guys think. So I'm trying to sort of demo the basics of this synthesizer, um, but you know, you guys let me know. Really uh, cool that you can use these square waves. I mean, I think it sounds. Bring the volume down. So it sounds a little thin almost because it's so bright. So if we get the chorus on, we will sh lose some of the, the that and maybe get something. Wow, that's big. Gotta turn the volume down a little bit more. Maybe f tighten up the tuning a bit. Yeah, there we go. Really large. Dalton, welcome to the stream. My first synth, and it, and I may be partial, but I love it. Love how it's a low-key sleeper, super rich sound hidden in that baby. Yes, that's what I, um, I totally agree with you, Dalton. My thing is sleeper vintage synth. So I love synthesizers that are not considered to be the best from the era. But in my opinion, the JX3 piece is actually like a hidden treasure. It is so beautiful sounding and basically hits all of everything you could want from a Juno 106 with a Jupiter 8 filter and two digitally controlled oscillators as compared to one on the Juno 106 or the 60 or whatever. I don't think the sound is quite up my alley, but I need to hear more patches. I hear you, Aquatic. So let's stop just fucking with the oscillators and let's mess with the filter more because that's when it's going to get good. So right now we got the filter all the way open. Let's bring it down. And while we're messing with it, let's set it back to sawtooth waves just so we can have, you know. Getting uh, more interesting, we'll add about 25% resonance, so. So 
so we really hear the filter. Without any resonance, let's do a nice little filter sweep here. And again, the stepping is just the implementation of the, uh, the SysX or whatever it is that the programmer uses. Let's do it again, but with halfway resonance. It's actually pretty gentle at halfway. Let's move it up to 75%. We're getting those sing-song harmonics. Let's try all the way for the fuck of it. Really, uh, really gorgeous in my opinion. It's not, it really doesn't sound bad at any point. Um, let's uh, check out the high pass filter too. So I'll play a chord. And I'll bring the high pass filter up. It's non-resonant. Hit the course knob. Easy to hit that. It's more of an EQ in a sense, right? Like certain sounds you might not want it to be as full. So it's nice to sort of bring some of the high pass, some of the low end out of it. Um, some darker, bassier sounds. Okay, well... Uh, let's take a break then real quick from sound design and let's talk about another really cool feature that is in uh, the PG2K and actually I think the standout feature of the PG2K which is the patch generator. So if I hit patch gen here, make sure you guys can see this hopefully. Uh, it's hard to see this little screen but I've got different, um, different uh, categories here. Uh, let's start with just random. So all I have to do is hit enter and it will adjust the Every single potentiometer in this synthesizer will adjust them uh, randomly. So you just get a completely random, crazy thing. So let's hit that real quick, just so you guys can hear what that sounds like. It's not always pretty. Actually, it is kind of nice. Tom says the JX33 was made during the development of the GR700 guitar synth and he even uses the same PG200 controller. That's correct. Yeah. So I mentioned that earlier in the stream that it's more or less like they had the architecture from the GR700 as I understand it. And we're like, hey, why don't we use this in a full fledged synth? And yes, you can use the original programmer, the PG200 from Roland uh, to create that. Hey, Marley, welcome to the stream. Finally made it to a live one. Well, welcome to the Scum family, my friend. We do this every Wednesday at 9. Always new, fun things in synthesis. So let's go ahead and try another patch. It generates them pretty quick. That's okay. We'll do another one. Yeah, here we go. Here's like a real random one. So the random patches on their own often aren't that useful because you wouldn't set everything randomly when you're doing sound design, right? So what Rob came up with, which I think is brilliant, is sort of um, intelligent ways to set the randomness within certain parameters. So in this case, I'm going to hit um, enter on category bass and we should get like a baseline sound. And so this is not a preset, right? This does ship with its own presets designed by Espen Craft, by the way, but let's not even talk about that. This isn't a preset. This is um, basically masking and using random numbers, to, but within confined values to come up with certain sounds that might be useful. Uh, this is so cool. So here's a bass sound. Almost like a, um, what is it? Like an organ bass type sound. Let's go ahead and try another patch real quick. Ooh, 
that's dark. Really great bass sound. Let's just hit another one. And again, these are not presets. They're just random assignments, but within certain confines. Oh, shit. That is dirty. We get to hit the chorus on. Getting this sort of like dirty techno sound. And just, I don't know how it sounds on your speakers, but in my headphones are like rattling from that bass. Really dark. Really cool. And we could move on to some other things. So, uh, for instance, maybe brass, we might get some darker type sounds. Uh, so let's try some brass sounds here uh, real quick. Let's try another one. That one's not that great. You'll sometimes get some that are not amazing because they're random. dollar tip my friend i appreciate it it said thank you for all of your efforts i appreciate you very much um and i appreciate everybody who gives you guys are awesome thank you um so yeah this patch is sick That's beautiful, right? Uh, let's try another brass patch. You can save all of these too, right? Little blippier, Game Boyer. Let's try another one. It's a fun, right? You spend hours just. Oh, nice and dark. Almost like an organ. And of course, like that's so dark. I kind of feel like it needs to open up. Really cool. Um, moving right along, let's try a couple more of these real quick. So uh, poly is a category of both synth patches and people. Oh, that's a little like out of tune. Yeah, organy. More of like a little bit of cross mod in there. Oh, this one's like a really great synth wave or a uh, synth pop. Oh, that would be like one I would save or maybe mess with. We could mess with the cutoff a bit. If I increased the LFO, what is it? Amount here? Well, we're getting out there. <laughs> hey, how's it going, Neil? It's my brother, Neil. What's up? Oh, thank you so much, Autumn. Thank you for hanging out as always, my friend. And good luck with your knee surgery. We'll see you before then, but uh, fuck yeah. Get that baby to bed. It's always fun hanging out with you. Um, so let's try this one. This is a great, like, uh, really great.
kind of a piano type sound. Moving right along to pads, probably my favorite category of synth sound. Actually very similar to the Juno-ish patch that we made with the SQ-80, um, where I was trying to kind of get that Juno type sound. So like a square pad type sound. Let's try another one for the fuck of it. Similar. Try another one. More of like an organ-y, uh, slow attack organ. Ooh, that's... It's actually love how that's uh has a chorus off it's just like really raw and authentic really uh could be useful kind of in that game boy t territory Wow, how cool is that? So while I'm holding it, you hear the LFO, but as I release, the filter goes up. Really, really cool. Yes, it sounds beautiful. I mean, that's the thing about the early Roland senses. It's hard to make a sound that doesn't sound good. Um, so we could try some effect sounds. So probably a lot of noise and uh, cross mod and stuff to get weird sci-fi effects. Try another one. Cool. I mean, I, I would use this for like sound design stuff, soundtrack stuff. Oh, yes. Oh my God, that is probably the most gorgeous sound of the night. I love that little bit of noise hidden in there along with like a high, probably square wave. Oh, it's just gorgeous. Just emotional, evocative. We could put the chorus on. Just love the way that beats. Uh, just really, really cool. Really beautiful. All right, moving right along to pianos. Let's try a couple of these out. Analog pianos, of course, they're not supposed to sound like real ones. More of an organ, try another one. I mean, really cool, interesting sounds. I think these random patches sound better than the presets, except for a couple of them, right? We've moved on to strings. Oh yeah, here we go, Juno strings galore. Cool. Let's try another string patch, see if we can get something brighter, maybe.
Really great, tender, evocative. Loving it. Try one more. More of a Juno-y type thing. Checked out Brass, Bells. We might get some interesting cross mod stuff. This is more like the analog bells patch that I created um, on the Chord Prologue stream. Try it again. Let's see if we can get one that's got some cross mod in it. Really love these uh, like kind of tender, um, low cutoff type sounds. Let's see what else we can get. Try again. Really snappy attack on that one. Just banging it out. Yeah, so basically if you watched uh, the analog bell design um, video that we did on the Korg Prologue, live you definitely heard how to make sounds like this um moving on and then we can hit uh like an in it patch back to that original sound so um let's go ahead and use the filter now we'll uh have it closed off down there and we'll apply the envelope here. So all I have to do is push that little knob up here, move back to main, and that will... And now we have control over this envelope so we can kind of add, and it's got this wonderful little diagram here so you can see what you're doing. Uh, we can get this sort of like brassier tone. Uh, if we increase the delay a lot, the decay, sorry, Increase the attack a little. All right, so that sounds pretty good. We could add a little bit of resonance because, you know. Increase the cutoffs. I want to get it nice and bright. Now we've got the oscillator mix about right, so let's add some detune in here. Now I'm interested in why I'm getting um, uh, envelope. So let's see if I add some to both the digitally controlled oscillators, what happens. Now, I don't know how. Oh, here we go. I think I have to turn these knobs on. See, that's affecting the pitch, my bad. I need to be over here on the um, amplifier. That's how we use the envelope to control both the filter and the amplifier, so the volume. That took me a second, sorry, it's embarrassing that it took me that long, uh, but you know, sometimes you forget some things. You always have to turn knobs on. It's so true, Nikki. <laughs> Oh my god. Really cool, really great, thick analog pad sound.
really got that. It's got that gate envelope VCA switch. Yes, took me a second to get there. My apologies. Uh, not the smartest all the time. <laughs> um, getting a bit of shoulder. Hard to see what you're doing sometimes. Ah, yes, I appreciate you letting me know. Uh, yeah, sometimes when I'm leaning forward, I need to... That's okay. I can probably be like this. Just drop down a little, right? less shoulder action perhaps when i do a little of that do you have to mod the jx3p at all in order to use the retroactive unit absolutely not it works you just plug it in and everything works it's awesome um you can use it with a modded jx3p it's actually got a bunch of functions that aren't in the original jx3p that you can control from the pg2k so for instance on the jx3p you cannot control the chorus rate but a kiwi modified jx or kiwi 3p or whatever you want to call it um you can so you can actually control that so there is a, a little knob there for that i don't think you can without it being modified so let's turn it on for a second yeah so it doesn't do anything unless you have that modified unit but what's so cool about um about this programmer is it's sort of set up to work to control just a, a stock one or a kiwi modified one and there's no other programmer on the market like that and i think you can also control multiple units so like for instance if you want to get like a um, mks 30 which is very similar is a rack mount version of this sort of you could do something like have uh six of the voices on the left side and six of the voices on the other things like that so it'd be very nice wow that's powerful really cool all right so all i have to do is hit shift and this button i should be back to an initialized preset let's drop the detune or the uh rough tune all the way down to 16 steps and let's set this second wave to a square wave Can you guys hear the bass on that? It should be fat, right? What I want to do now is create like a really dark bass line sound. So let's detune it. Really detuned, right? Actually, we should maybe start with just using one step of the course detune. Maybe negative four on the course detune. It's a little hard. I'm going for that Reese type sound, right? A little too thick right now. Let's kick the chorus on. Very thick. Bring the cutoff down. Bring the res bring the resonance up. So by boosting the resonance there on that low frequency, what we can do is sort of emphasize it. Tell me if you can hear the difference. It's hard with these headphones. I think the volume compensation of the filter makes it so it's about the same. But as we, now all we have to do is add some envelope to it and make this envelope nice and snappy.
sounds really thick, really aggressive. Um, and so, of course, we could also like maybe move the uh, the second one up an octave and see what we get here. You know, a little bit of a Knights or Ebb type sound. We could try the noise. Really kind of different type of sound. You know. Kind of almost more like a slap bass type sound because you get a little bit of that grit in there. I actually kind of like that more, even though it is cool when you have the detuned saw. Yeah, the, the bass is, is thick. She thick. One thing is I wish the uh, tr amount of the envelope could go a little further. get the most bass as the cut up is higher if I turn the resonance off. thick and big <laughs> yeah it sounds really grimy really big um we could of course always like thin it out actually with the high pass or use that in part of the song to do something let's let the lfo do something so we could set the lfo to control the filter, for instance. So I guess if I increase the LFO amount here, we'll hear. Oh yeah, here we go. Here we here comes the the dubstep. Control the rate right here. Now a really cool feature is we can add a delay to the LFO so that when it it. If I put the delay all the way up, you won't hear the LFO at all for a while, hopefully. See, it fades in that delay, but it's maybe a, a much shorter amount would be cooler. So what we, we get the um, sort of the impact of the envelope, giving it that pluck, uh, but then we get the LFO later. crazy Reese we could probably bring the LFO just a little bit down I actually like it like crazy wobble baseline sound. Um, oh, and the random LFO wave. So yeah, how do I get to that with this? Oh, here, I've got just like a nice little LFO wave thing. So here's the LFO on sign. I'm gonna turn the delay off, that way you guys can hear. Here, uh, let's see what else we got. So we got sign, square, on the uh, 
On here, we've got a few other shapes, but I guess that must be if you have a modified GX3P, but who likes that? So Square Wave, kind of its own cool sound. Interesting, uh, but then, yeah, then we get random. So let's check this out. I'm gonna increase the delay so it kind of comes in slower. cool hey here's another thing we could do let's turn the lfo off here see if that do anything no but it should turn it off right oh all the way off right now what we could do is apply that to both of the uh to dco2 for instance right and even vco1 or dco1 and what that'll do is it'll modulate the pitch so we'll start off with a usable baseline sound right but as I hold a key down, we'll start getting really random stuff. I think. Stupid me, I have to turn it on. you know, discordant with it. Really cool. We can just turn that back off and apply it back to the filter. Get that sort of weird talking thing. If I put the resonance all the way up, we could get some really talky stuff. It's like helper. so hopefully that shows that this synthesizer can go much further than cheesy 80s sounds like we can get really dark really atonal dissonant sci-fi type stuff let's go ahead and try that again but with the noise wave i want to try something like that <laughs> We can get really crazy with it, right? That's pretty sick. We're like getting into some Doctor Who territory. It is fire, Dalton. It is something else, isn't it? It's a really beautiful, gorgeous thing. And um, it really does come down to just that filter being gorgeous and incredible. So yeah, it's, it's a, it goes much deeper than just, uh, you know, your kind of like garden variety type, you know, type sounds. It can do that. It can do the,
it can do that, but it can also go really deep into some pretty crazy territory. Um, droids having a chat. Yes. Yo, 40 thieves. How's it going? Sounded like the TV scene in Willy Wonka. Yeah. So definitely a lot of those older, like seventies movies, they didn't have digital synthesis to come up with all sorts of crazy sci-fi stuff. So you did hear more of these ways of creating, uh, analog sci-fi sounds. So sometimes when you mess with things, you'll, uh, you'll start to get that sort of a sound, uh, automatically, uh, which is really cool. Um, let's see. Uh, well, first off, do you guys want me to make any sounds? Uh, I'd be happy to show something, whether it be, you know, bells, super saws, hoovers, any sorts of, uh, sounds you'd like to hear analog stuff. Um, real quick. I want to see if I could just create a quick, uh, bell. To Whoa, sorry. Little bell. Maybe we'll use a pulse wave here up a couple of octaves. Oh, uh, let me, um, sorry, let me shift in it to create an init patch. And then use this again. Little this, little of uh, that. Maybe we'll just use the square. Nice little square wave type sound. Um, let's go ahead and put the envelope on both the, oh, sorry, not there, on the amplifier. really tight type thing. That way we can get that sound. Now I've got it super tight because I want to get the envelope right, but I'm going to add some sustain and release to this. So we've got a kind of an analog bell sound here. Um, Dalton would be here to hear some 303 type sounds and using the sequencer. <laughs> uh, so I totally forgot to learn how to use the se sequencer. Uh, it's not difficult. It's only got a couple of things here, uh, but it could do it for sure. We'll do something 303 like in a split second. I wanted to demonstrate though real quick, this metal mode. So we've got a couple of different ways to do cross mods. So this is the sort of bell sound on its own. And I have to say, just the raw tone of it actually, to me, sounds slightly better than the result that I got with the Korg Prologue. Uh, really cool, really nice sound. Now, as I move through the different modes here, you can hear this is, we'll start with sync, more familiar synth sound. All right, that's not doing much because the pitch is uh, locked, but as we move the course, And what we have to do is we have to modulate the pitch here too. Otherwise to get that famous sync sound. So we're all actually with that, we're getting something of a 303 type sound, right? Like if I change this in. without even actually using the filter. Just think about that for a second.
pretty cool hard sync type sounds. But now if we move it over into metal mode, we get this very different type of thing. Let me uh, disable the uh, envelope depth here on the pitch here. Actually, I don't want that on at all. And I believe we're getting some sort of cross mod here. You know, sync could be used to do. Getting that type of sound, but moving over to metal. Gets a very different type of sound. Um, nasty techno sequence. Okay, so I definitely should have figured this out. Let's see what happens if I just press the start sequencer button. That's weird. And then... All right, so let's write and see what happens if I just go... All right, so I think it just wrote that in. Well, that's incredibly simple. I didn't, I shouldn't have been so intimidated by it. So let's go ahead and uh, uh, b berserk first, click right first. Yes, yeah, so what I'll do is let's write another one in and we'll go. There we go. Okay, so that should be a sequence. So this is something that the uh, this is something that the uh, JX AP doesn't have. I'm going to actually initialize it. to the matrix. So this is how we're gonna get the acid type sounds. We got the sequence going. We need to have the filter fall in a pluck. Uh, so we have to start with a dark cutoff and then add some by increasing the envelope here. Unfortunately, this filter isn't that that squelchy and without distortion, it's not going to quite sound like that.
apply that to the uh, voltage control amplifier too by just hitting this button, right? If we want to keep it kind of plucky and kind of like uh, so it's not super thick, we could uh, just apply the envelope and then we get this sound. Or if we want full thickness all the time, we could turn the envelope off. So that's how you would create that like dark Knights of Red, you know, early industrial, the Matrix Reloaded type sound that you might want to create uh, that sort of 90s, uh, like late 80s, 90s, dirty analog uh, bass line sound, techno, uh, aggressive bass line sound. That sounds really great. like that daddy loves a tight is really thick and deep. Yeah, Knights of Red, but also John Carpenter for sure. Yeah, it's all in that neighborhood. It it does really uh really kicks ass. I'm glad you brought that up. Um bringing out the uh bringing uh Dalton bringing out the sequencer because I uh totally would have missed that I I don't use sequencers that often but it was actually a really fun sort of uh example of things you could do with it um I mean actually to me out of all the sounds we made I think that's the coolest one right I'm a slut for those like industrial techno type sounds um so yeah that's uh where we're at with that have I played any Moogs I'll be right back I want to drink this beer crank a little music on have I played any modes? I don't think I've played one. I don't even think I've ever played one Moog in my life. <laughs> yeah. Every so often I'll see something on reverb that I'm like curious about, and then I don't get it. <laughs> um, I was looking at a used one today. What, which, which one were you looking at, Aquatic? 
There's a couple of things about Moogs. One is the ladder filters are famous for losing bass as they go, uh, as you crank the resonance. And this synth loses a little bass. Oberheim loses a little bass. The Korgs do not. The Korgs really pass bass wonderfully, which is awesome. Uh, Matriarch. Yeah, so if there's one modern Moog synth I'd want to get, it's the Matriarch. It's a super cool synth. Uh, sounds amazing. The thing about Moog, modern Moog, is the quality is just incredible. Like, they sound amazing. And it's also an employee-owned company, so you can feel good about supporting... Um, the actual employees of the company versus like sometimes it doesn't feel great giving your money to corporations right it's like well you know they're already making so much money and moog does charge a shitload but the the sound is there and the matriarch i think is a very reasonably priced offering from them anything above that one like the moog one hard to justify that price tag but something like the matriarch especially if you can get one like used um really cool synthesizer for sure um does anybody have any further questions for this synthesizer or the pg2k before we sign off tonight um it's always fun to uh get a chance to talk with you guys and uh or ask me anything about anything i don't care if you ask me about my sex life whatever you know that's what we're here to do right here to talk about it um, next week, we are continuing the month of Roland Vintage Synthesizers with the Roland D50. So that's going to be awesome. It's going to be really fun to sort of compare uh, the sound of like this beautiful analog synth that, although is gorgeous with the Jupiter 8 filter, is limited to those analog synth type sounds. The D50, you'll hear quickly, it's like how much digital synthesis opened up the game in terms of using samples and just also things like, um, instead of the filter only being a low pass, being able to use high pass filters and notch filters, band pass filters, all of that stuff that's pretty much outside the domain of analog synthesis. Um, Max, welcome to the stream. Hello. How many patches can you store in the PG2K? And can you play them directly from the controller or do you need to transfer them to the 3P? That's a great question. Let's, I think we can figure that out pretty quickly. Uh, what is it? Shift assign? We can store um, in here, like say we wanted to save that sound. Right. Why don't we actually do that? That would be fun. So we're going to store that tone. We're going to store, so I'll hit enter. Whoop, uh, let's go back, back. How do I get out of this? Sometimes it takes me a second because I'm not that used to it. Uh, main, all right. So shift assign brings us to store and we're going to store a tone in bank two, let's say. And we can store how many patches just in bank two? 64 patches in bank two, I think. And then we've got bank one, two, which comes preloaded with Espen Croft's patches, which are really great too, by the way. But so let's go ahead and just store this as patch two real quick, just because I want to keep that techno baseline sound. Enter and the name, uh, we could go through and write a name. Uh, so I'll do that while we're, while we're chatting here. So, um, 64 at least. Gotta go. Thanks for the stream. Hey, Aquatic, thank you very much for your donation, and I'll see you next week for the D50. Appreciate you always supporting the channel, my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. GX3P layered with a DX7. Both came out around the same time. Marley, thank you for the $6.66 donation. Let me check this out real quick. Marley said, thanks, man. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you for uh, hanging out with us. This was a lot of fun. Uh, so, and you got me to save this patch. So, or somebody did, sorry. Uh, who did? Max asked me. But no, it's really great to uh, hang out with you live. I have run out of patience. So we're just going to call this Nits 2. Enter. Tone stored. Now, let's see real quick if I load this one. Uh, whoop go back main uh, shift left to cancel all right let's go to main and then let's uh, load a patch shift let's go and uh, load a patch enter let's load this one 
and then let's try loading the Nitzer patch and see what we get. Yeah. So Rob, if you're watching this, there's still some issues I've noticed with storing patches with the JX3 piece stock. I get like different filter shapes than I did, um, than I saved it. So not a big deal. You could quickly fix that, but not a, not a big thing. Um, all right. So if nobody else has anything to say, I just want to say that this is the, for me, like, even when I see a great deal on a Juno 106, which is a good, if you can get a good deal on one, it's really cool because it's going to be worth a lot. Everybody wants Juno 106s. But if you can get a great deal on a JX3P, first off, it'll be like half the price of a Juno 106. Um, and then you can afford to get a PG2K and still have a lot of money left over, like 500 bucks to 1,000 bucks left over. And to me, this is the better, more compelling synth, better value synth to get. If I could have a JX3P with the controller or a Juno 106 for the same price, I would go with the JX3P because you got those two oscillators you can control independently versus a 106 where you only have that sub oscillator and you get the Jupiter 8 filter. I think this is much, much cooler. Um, so yeah, and, and like Tom was saying, you could layer this with like a DX7 and it would get incredible. Um, yeah, it's just a really great synth. JX8P, also a really great synth and speaks to sort of roll in at their golden era of analog synthesis. It has its own sound. Um, sometimes it's a little simple sounding. Uh, it's not the most complex synth. I really did cover almost everything you can do with it. Uh, there are a few other things I probably didn't cover, but we got pretty close to getting over it. And that's hard to do with a lot of these synths. We, it's been two hours and we pretty much like, I feel like I've summarized what's going on with the synth pretty well. Um, and so there are synths that are more complicated, you know, from the 80s, from around the same time. But that's what people love about early Roland stuff is that it's simple. Everything's tuned to the sweet spot, you know? It really, it's like hard to play, how, hard to program it badly. And then you have someone like Rob from Retroactive coming along and creating this incredibly, also I didn't say this earlier, the build quality on this is is incredible. Like it's gorgeous. It's like built like a tank. It's built better than the JX3P. If every knob and fader feels great. Uh, I have other programmers from Retroactive, but this one's my favorite. I think it just looks and feels amazing. Uh, it feels like a million bucks. And uh, yeah, so I think it's just a great, um, a great, combination to have uh max says cheers i have the detronics controller but i'm thinking i might pick this one up detronics makes great stuff too um i've always lusted after that giant detronics controller for the dx7 and they make one for the d50 which i'd be interested in messing around with um i don't have any detronics controllers so i can't control them back to back but what i can say is the retroactive stuff is incredible um you know, it, it. I think it's worth it just for the patch generator. Like that is the coolest feature, and all of his controllers do that. So the Alpha Juno, the DW8000, um, the JX10 one. They have one for the Jupiters. Like it, they're really powerful, incredible um, programmers, and it's been fun to test these guys out together and be able to do that. So um, yeah, without uh, saying anything else, real quick, um, something that I've changed is now these streams, when I end the stream, what happens is it'll take you to next week's stream. Uh, so next week's stream, the Roland D50. So when I end the stream, uh, if you guys go ahead and hit the little notification bell there, that way you'll be re reminded when I go live. I don't think you guys need any reminders because you guys are always here, but in case you're new to the channel, it might be helpful to go ahead and actually hit that little notification bell. That way you know when Scum Night is live next week. Roland D50, then the JD800, then the JP8000, and I fucking love you guys. Have a wonderful night, and I'll see you next week, okay?